Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to this decision webinar uh, from Pitch to Partnership, the new rules of working with journalists with a fantastic panellist, Alison Phillips, Janelle Aldred, Lily Cantor and Luke Jacobs. Uh, my name is Claudia Liza Vanderpoy. I'm a presenter and journalist at Five News and I will be your host for today. Now we're going to be discussing the changing role of journalists, uh, how digital and social media has transformed uh, the way they work, uh, what PRs can do to build stronger relationships with reporters, producers, the entire editorial team actually, and also what you need to, to put forward a strong, successful pitch. Uh, so I've mentioned our panellists by name, but let me go into a little bit more detail, give a fuller introduction. As I said, um, Alison Phillips is joining us today. So delighted that she can join us. She is the editor of the Daily Mirror. Alison began her career as a reporter at Harlow Star before joining the Sunday People magazine, where she became a features editor before moving on to the Daily Mirror as editor in chief, uh, overseeing the print and digital side of things there. Janelle Aldred also uh, joins us. She is the founder of GAC, which is Janelle Aldred Consultancy, uh, where she develops communication strategies, media and presentation training. Janelle's also previously uh, worked in both journalism and PR. I say journalism. Uh, she worked with me here at ITN. She's worked at ITV News, but also at Channel 5 News. We sit together as a co-presenter at 5 News. I miss her awfully. I tried to persuade her to stay and not go into PR. It didn't work, uh, but she's doing incredibly well with her consultancy. Uh, she's been head of digital strategy, also at an international NGO, manager of a Freeview TV channel and communications director at The Pipeline. Also joining us today is Lily Cantor. Now she is a freelance journalist and co-founder of the award-winning Freelancing for Journalists uh, podcast. Uh, I'd also say she's been freelancing since uh, 2018, writing about uh, personal finance, health, and actually running. Also with us uh, today, completing our lineup is Luke Jacobs. He is regional editor for Reach in the Southeast. Uh, Luke's runs a brand including Kent Live, Surrey Live, and Sussex Live. He also leads the regional content diversity strategy as new audiences editor, aimed at ensuring its local newsrooms reflecting their community. Hello to you all. Good afternoon. I've got lots to talk to you about before um, I do start uh, talking to you. And let me just explain some of the areas we'll be uh, discussing uh, today. Uh, first, we're going to be looking at the, the journalism landscape of 2022, uh, if you like, and the big challenges uh, that reporters and editorial teams as a whole are facing. We're also going to be examining a social media and how journalists are using it and how publications are positioning themselves across social platforms. And then we're going to be discussing as well the relationships between journalists and PRs, what's the best way for PRs to, to cut through the noise, if you like, and get from inboxes to actually being on the editorial team's uh, calendars. Plus we're gonna have uh, lots of advice from the do's and don'ts uh, when it comes to working uh, with journalists. And finally, if you have any questions at all, we've already had some questions coming in, but if you have any more questions, anything you want to add to put to the panelists, uh, just send them our way you should see a chat or Q&A box um, just on this zoom send it our way and we will put two panelists at the end of this discussion uh, but first let's as I said we we're going to talk about journalism in 2022 how the landscape has changed and Alison if I could start with yourself how would you say things have changed from the moment when you entered uh, journalism and became a journalist yourself how have things changed over the years um well, oh, hi, and thank you for having me along. Um, well, clearly, I think um, things have changed out of all recognition over the last 20, 25 years, <clears throat> perhaps more so than any other industry that I could have chosen to have gone into back then. Um, because, you know, when I first started out, the internet it wasn't even a thing. You know, so, so news was very much a kind of a one way um, funnel from um, from the top down to the readers who just sort of had to accept what they were given and there was no real voice than perhaps, you know, a, <clears throat> a weekly or maybe a daily uh, letters page. Um, it was very much uh, the news and what the news was, was decided very much by, you know, by, by men in, in grey suits in towers. And they, they were men and they were largely wearing grey suits and they were in the big towers in London. So it was very much um, a sort of a top-down um, approach to news and what constituted news. And so I think a big thing, particularly over in recent um, years, has been 
well, certainly with, with social media as well, you had that democratization of news and that more people are able to say what they feel the news is. And of course, you've got readers are able to um, comment in real time on how they feel about particular stories. And of course, you're able to see which stories people are interested in. So you've got, also got the real time data as to what is working with your readers and what's not working. Um, and you can use that to inform your decisions. So, um, and, and then obviously on top of all that, there's also been the challenges of um, fake news and breakdown in trust between um, news consumers and news creators. And so, you know, there's challenges coming in all directions. But at the same time, I think it's made it a really interesting landscape. And I think it's one where the power of journalism and what it can achieve remains as powerful as ever. Uh, what about you, Janelle, if you put your journalism hat on? Uh, how would you say things, and actually can even put your PR, put both hats on. Uh, how do you think things have changed from the moment you entered journalism and even from the moment you went into the world of PR? Yeah, how do you say news has changed in that time? So my very first job in the BBC was actually putting the news on the internet. And at that time it was a job called Slice and Dice. There was no algorithm. No one was counting how many people looked at it. It was just about putting the news on there and also trying to convince the journalists that they should put their stories on the internet before it broke on the six o'clock or 10 o'clock news. Now we know like trying to keep a journalist from telling you about their story before the news happens, <laughs> things have changed massively. So I think social media then added on to that has really ramped up that change as Alison was saying it's ramped it up so much and I think the thing that's a lot different about journalists when I was at the BBC when I first started reading the news you know I wasn't allowed to have an opinion on Twitter I wasn't allowed to kind of say anything like who I voted for you weren't allowed to give any of that away and actually it's one of the things I found the most frustrating I didn't have a voice I couldn't have an opinion and I think now what we've seen in terms of the role of journalists is there's far much more opinion opinion pages used to be something in the corner of a newspaper and now there's a lot of opinion so there is a lot of truth because there's so many news outlets but some of that truth now is a bit more subjective and down to kind of the paper or the broadcast or the platforms that people are working for and what works well in that space. So I think, um, as Alison alluded to, sometimes trust is gone, but some of that is about how news is now disseminated on those different places. So I think that makes journalist jobs easier in some ways, but trickier in other ways, because how do people know what's the truth if it's also my opinion wrapped up in there? Uh, you really reminded me. I remember when yeah Twitter first came on the scene, I want to say 2010, the BBC refused to go on it initially because you know what the BBC is like, you can't promote anything, right? You can't be seen, you can't be cast be advert, as I said, not, not promoting any kind of company or organizational brand. So it was so tricky for the B to, to go on there originally and for journos to go on there. Now, can you keep journos off Twitter? I don't think you so. You weren't allowed a blog Twitter. when I was a journo at BBC. Only about six presenters were allowed to have a blog and they were all national. So Not. things have changed. Yeah, <laughs> things have really, really changed. What about you, Lily? As as a freelancer, I you know, you could easily argue that it's your job because if you don't you don't find the work you're not going to eat you know you're not going to get paid so more so in particular with a freelancer you really do need to stay across what is changing and if you know it's better sell yourself to stay in there with maybe uh, publications broadcasters etc how have things changed from the moment you start became a journalist and started working in journalism i think the main thing is as as a as others have alluded to, is really um, the way in which we're communicating is very different and it's very, um, it, it's online now, isn't it? And so there's been, been that shift from, I guess, when I started reporting, pretty much everything I did was face to face. It was always going out and interviewing people. I started off in a local newspaper. Now it's quite rare for me to do an interview face to face. There's been the shift during the pandemic to Zoom, which I try and um, push back on a little bit, but sometimes a phone call is just a lot quicker and a lot um, more effective, I find. Um, obviously, the ways in which freelancers are, are connecting with commissioning editors has changed. Really, in the last couple of years, there's been a massive shift um, that a lot more commissioning editors are actually doing calls for freelance pitches on social media, particularly on Twitter. Um, and I don't think that was happening so much in the past. There's also a lot of newsletters out there now, for freelancers, um, where people are curating um, 
you know, which editors have got budgets and what kind of content they're looking for. So it's a lot more transparent and a lot more open. And I think in many ways, it's a lot easier for freelancers to find work. There's certainly a lot more opportunities out there because there are so many different types of publications. There's so many different platforms online. It's not just, you know, your mainstream kind of newspapers where you can find work. Um, you know, even with a lot of magazines closing, there are so many opportunities online, but there is a lot of competition because we've moved into this space now where, like we said, sort of everyone's got an opinion, everyone's got something to say, everybody thinks they're a freelance journalist. So, you know, you're kind of battling against that and trying to get a foothold in quite a crowded marketplace. And Luke, I, I, first of all, I love what you do. Regional news is where it's at. I have, I have never, out of all the uh, places I've worked, all the broadcasters I've worked with, it's always regional audiences who are, are more connected. In fact, I can just for my for my experience. So, uh, somebody who, who's heading up uh, regional publications, how have things changed for you? I, I imagine most of your publications are online now. It's not in hard copy. That's exactly area. right. That's, that's exactly right, Eliza. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you said that because I think I agree with you. I think we're, we're still very much uh, connected to our communities, particularly when it comes to day-to-day uh, -day matters. You know, we've seen, we've seen over the last couple of years, um, we've gone from crisis to crisis, and that's where people, well, I hope anyway, they, they kind of turn to us uh, for really, the really trusted news or at least um, information that they can rely on day-to-day. Um, -day. I'd say that's probably... Um, in terms of what's changed over the last kind of decade or so since I've been in the industry, I mean, I like to think we've probably become a slightly more meritocratic. Um, the guys have alluded to social media uh, being the, the huge driver of that. Um, you know, the gatekeepers uh, when it, you know, when it when it when it came to what what we should cover and when um, they're not the same people, um, or at least that they, they themselves have changed as well. And that's probably down to you know, journalists being slightly more empowered um, to cover content that. You know that they that they believe is important um and then they're speaking to their own audiences um in that sense as well and, and that's that's a huge change compared to say you know when i started when it was very much you almost kind of had to fit into a bit of a straitjacket as to the kind of content we did have to cover now, it may have been the kind of traditional fare that you might associate with local news and regional news and it's very different now you know we're a lot, we're a lot more creative now in, in in what we cover and of course we're responding to um to what our audience wants you know looking at data and looking at um at what they say to us as well um they can come to us a lot a lot quicker now of course um and that helps us to kind of inform what you know what kind of information and, and entertainment essentially sometimes we're, we're giving them i miss my local newspaper however i do still go online to check uh, you guys out but um uh, so I don't know if you would have noticed something that happened over the last couple of years. It wasn't even a big deal. You probably didn't even notice. Um, something called COVID. Uh, it was a like a virus and it just started hitting everybody and places have to shut. Okay, jokes aside, COVID happened um, over the last couple of years, which meant uh, many things had to change. And, and you know, actually Lily touched on some of the things that changed from her perspective. Go to her in a moment. But Janelle, for you, how did things change? How did the pandemic change the way journalists work and well for me the pandemic was kind of the time when I actually finally exited <laughs> journalism kind of fully in that sense because I think <laughs> and sitting next to you and um, but that was when that kind of changed for me just because of the ways of working and at the time I didn't really still want to be in a newsroom and all of those things but I think one of the other things that changed for me in terms of from the other side is I started doing a lot more on-screen training for businesses who were looking for press and, and all of those different things that actually it became much more important to be good on screen and good on camera. And I think that's something that's changed for a lot of journalists as well um, over the pandemic. But I think the others may be able to speak to that um, more than more than I. Alison, how do things uh, change uh, for journalists at the Daily Mirror? For you as an editor? Well, I mean, it was the it was the it was just huge. I mean, at the time, I remember saying, you know, this is the biggest story of our generation. This is the most important story that we'll ever work on. Um, because if you think back to the beginning where there was no um, sign of a vaccine and we didn't know what numbers of um, deaths we were going to be facing, it was truly shocking. And, and so I think, you know, you had journalists who were um, reporting on that news, but of course they were also um, living with the consequences of COVID in their own um, domestic lives. 
and you know we had people that became very poorly through it um but we still you know had other people that were still having to go out on jobs we were all working from home as you know elsewhere in the country so um and i think we felt very very strongly i think a lot of mirror journalists have always felt very strongly their role in um not just reporting on the news but doing their bit to try and make our society a better place to live and i think we felt that particularly strongly during covid and that we, we placed huge emphasis on not just telling the news but explaining the news because um, all the kind of research would show that it's only when people feel really kind of overwhelmed and bewildered by the news that they that they turn away from it. And we know, don't we, that a lot of deaths um, that came about during COVID were among people who hadn't had the best quality information or who had believed fake news um, that they'd read on online, maybe. Um, and so we really felt it, it, that it was important to explain the news and um, explain the the, the potential ways that this might play out in the future so that people felt they had some kind of control in a situation which for a lot of people felt it was hugely out of control and, and and the other thing that we placed huge emphasis on was um trying to be there almost as a kind of a friend or a sort of a crutch to, to people you know you know a lot of our print readers are that bit older a lot of people were very lonely they were living alone um a lot of our um digital readers are that bit younger um, and again you know there was huge levels of loneliness there as well and so we were trying to sort of also create content that was entertaining filled the days and just sort of somehow made that whole period tolerable but it was a it was it was an incredible challenge and um and there were so many twists and turns with it if you go back there was the point where the ppe shortages were so poor then there was the thing about whether they were going to get a vaccine then there was all the kind of chaos around closing the borders i mean there was like one disaster after the other and that's before you even got to the bit about you know breaking covid rules and all the rest of it so i mean it was a story that just kept on kept on giving so but yeah it was yeah. a good story <laughs> uh, really uh, extraordinary times i remember uh so it hadn't hit uh, the UK yet, yeah, uh, COVID, and I was looking at what was going on in other countries, so in Asia, in Italy, gosh, remember those pictures of Italy, we thought, oh, for you, I thank God that's not happening uh, here, and I remember googling, you know, this, is, Italy, is Italy's TV news stations working, are they operating, looking at what, how it could come here, and what, what we would need to do to change things as, as TV broadcasters. Uh, Luke, how did things, how did the pandemic change for you and your team and your publications, even though you are uh, predominantly online, that still meant you still just you still do have newsrooms, I, I imagine. And did it mean your staff started working from home mostly? Yeah, yes and no, Claudia Liza. Um, it just feels like ages ago now, doesn't it? It I does. Mean, it feels like a lifetime ago. It's only two and a half years, isn't it? But it's only feels like it's like twenty and a half years. Um, so the first thing or the main thing for us that's changed is is how we work. Um, you know, as Alison's saying, you know, we are very much part of it as well. You know, it's affecting us personally, but you know, we had to cover it. And in that sense, it was, you know, it became quite exhausting um, and very relentless, as I think many journalists would, would say the same thing. But you know, what yeah, what changed for us was uh, we immediately started working from home. Uh, we still do largely do that. Um, and we cover us of a very wide area in the southeast as well. So you know, we're we're in London and surrounding it. Um, so in that sense, we are close to the community in that we work remotely and we work on patch. Uh, we don't um, have you know, the kind of full time office environment that we used to have. So, of course, it then meant that our in the emphasis on what we covered and, and how we covered it and, and how we um, and when we when we're bringing in new people, how that works has changed as well. And we've had to adjust um, very quickly. Um, in that as well. And I'd, I'd say that our teams have done a, a really good job in terms of providing the, a similar service compared to, say, two and a half years ago um, as to what, you know, what, what, we're, what we're kind of publishing and, and presenting now to our readers now. So, yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is our, our, the, way we, the way we work uh, compared to them. Um, and also, you know, when it comes to kind of bringing in new people as well, how we're training those people and what we're getting them used to, to covering when it comes to content um, and that kind of, their style of working as well. Uh, Lily, you, you, as I mentioned earlier, you, you touched on how the pandemic changed things for you. I think one of them is you got lots of people you into wanting to do it on Zoom. Uh, that's that's a big change. Uh, I imagine also how how you work, how you see your job as a freelancer uh, could have changed. So, how important is it for you for for freelancers as a whole, even to be entrepreneurial? 
uh, because you've also got your podcast as well is, is that part of you just having pu pushing yourself forward not just as a person as a business a brand if you like yeah definitely I think that was a big shift that we saw during the pandemic because a lot of people um either found found themselves freelance because they were they were made redundant or they were freelance already but they lost a lot of work because publications stopped commissioning or shut down um, so people had to find different ways of making money or they had a bit more time on their hands so they did that project that they always wanted to do and i think the thing about freelancers is on the whole you know we we are pretty entrepreneurial because we have to be we you know we are our you know we're, we're ducking businesses. the diving the hustle all of that yeah, definitely um and so yeah i saw you know a lot of people um started newsletters for example just individual freelancers starting newsletters a lot of podcasts started popping up people started doing training webinars um maybe started a, a blog there was a lot of sort of experimentation going on and some of that's fallen by the wayside but a lot of it is, is stuck around um and there's definitely kind of new models um for working and training in particular um i think as janelle you know alluded to as well there's a lot more happening online and i think for us at freelancing for journalists we're very much um, of the view that to be freelance, you don't need to be in London, even myself or my, my business partner are in London. Um, and so I think there was that shift in mindset as well, that actually we can be freelance anywhere. And this is an opportunity for us to cover, you know, other parts of the country um, and very much be, be mobile. But for us at Freelancing for Journalists, I mean, we didn't exist before the pandemic. Um, it was the pandemic that really- Are you guys hearing Lily okay? Can everyone hear me? I can hear No, me. go ahead, yeah. No, it's cool, it might be me. Um, yeah, so before the pandemic, freelancing for journalists didn't exist. Um, we had written a book that was due to come out in 2020, which it did, but I think we just found that there was suddenly a need for training, resources, information. And so we started putting on different events. We started the podcast series. We started a remote work experience scheme. Um, and there was just a lot of take up. And, and like I say, the, the entrepreneurial side of it, I think it's been really important because it is a precarious landscape for freelancers and having different and diverse revenue streams is really important. Um, so if you can earn your own income doing something else, like having a podcast that is sponsored, um, you know, or a newsletter with advertising, that can just give you a different revenue stream to just relying on, um, you know, publications and broadcasters. So I think there's definitely been an uptake in that. Mm, uh, Luke, uh, what kind of challenges are, are you seeing in 2022 or even foresee uh, for the rest of the year? I'd say, um, you know, that trust in a kind of quote unquote sort of mainstream media and the questioning of, of, of facts is, is going to be a huge challenge for kind of all of us um, in the future, now and in the future. Um, when it comes to, to regional news, uh, I think the, the belief has always been that the trust in us tends to be slightly more um, secure. Um, but even then, I think with some of these really kind of hot button issues and these issues that, that are quite divisive of course we've, we're seeing today the coverage of that first Rwanda flight and it has local impact for us as well because you know, Kent is one of our, our main brands and it's you know it's, it's something that's affecting local people we can already see the reaction to some of our coverage um there where they're questioning everything that that, that we're publishing about that which in itself presents another challenge to our writers and um, that's something for us as well to consider as, as editors as to, as to what we're what we're asking them to do. Um, I'd also say uh, technology, of course, as well. Um, and we've spoken a lot about journalists having their own, you know, their own newsletters and their own platforms and everything too. Um, you know, where we need to go where our audience is. I think perhaps traditionally we would hope that the audience would come to us. It doesn't it doesn't work like that anymore. You know, our audience is on different platforms. They're in different places, and so. No chance for us as an industry as we continue to keep evolving uh you know, where, where are we are we ahead of of where our readers are going to be and, and that's can sometimes can be a difficult thing particularly when it comes to the kind of generational shift uh 
you know, when it comes to, uh, say, putting our news in places perhaps where we haven't been used to, to putting it, um, and actually, you know, without getting too kind of existential about it, you know, what is news when it, when it comes to that? Do people, um, do, do potential readers know what, what news is? Um, you know, is it, is it stuff of interest to them on a day-to-day -day basis or is it kind of events that they should be aware of because it may impact them? Uh, obviously, we're seeing the, the war overseas and it's affecting affecting everything about us, isn't it? Affecting our day-to-day -day and, our, and our cost of living and everything. And how do we communicate and how do we filter or do we filter? Is that something perhaps, again, that we need to we need to consider, you know, what, what, what choices are we making? And I think that's, again, as I say, you know, in terms of going to the places that people who um, haven't been served particularly well by us uh, previously and, and, and presently, uh, you know, where, where are we going to, to reach, those, um, reach those communities and reach those audiences? And Alison, uh, recent surveys have shown that Generation Z, I'm going to say Z because we're in Britain, uh, Generation Z are largely getting uh, their news from social media. So how has that changed things at the Daily Mirror when you're looking at, you know, print versus those social media platforms? Where, where do you put your focus when, when you, when, as I say, more and more people are getting their news from, from social media? Well, um, virtually all our news is digital first. So it goes straight into digital. And then we um, just select some of that for the following days. Uh, That's print. a huge change, Alison, huge. From early, as in, from when I got into news 20 years ago, I remember that 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 fear that um, publications and newspapers are almost scared of online. And they, you know the yeah. focus was on making sure people buy print. Yeah, but I think um, the, 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 the real, the, 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 there's so many realities that people just had to, to grab hold of. One of which is that something only remains exclusive for a couple of minutes anyway before, you know, if you, if you put all the effort in saving it into print and then, um, you know, somebody else can get it out digitally within, within seconds anyway. So you need to make sure that if it's going anywhere digitally, it's going on your own platforms first. Um, and then the, 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 second, the second thought is that we have to, grow obviously we have to be growing our audience digitally um and in print the audience is incredibly loyal so a, a mirror reader goes into a shop and already knows they're going to buy the mirror before they've even stepped in the door as does the sun reader so so really it's very very rare that you'll have anything on your front page which um means that you'll take a reader off of um an opponent so um so that's not really that, that's not really kind of the, the priority now. The priority for us is about obviously getting our content read as wide as possible, but also ensuring that our brand um, has a longevity, which means that people, when they, when they do look at things on social or through their Facebook feed or whatever, that of those um, stories that are there, they tend, they gravitate towards the ones which come from a brand that they recognize and that they trust. Um, and obviously, you know, um, that's particularly important still in, social media platforms that are sort of, of, of Instagram and TikTok where um, it's, you know, we still haven't quite worked through where the revenue is going to come from in those. Whereas in Facebook, um, obviously, you know, get huge, huge numbers of um, traffic comes via Facebook and we make money from that as well. But obviously Facebook is for an older audience, which, you know, gonna, at some point are going to go the same way as, as that print audience. So you've got to sort of keep, um, You've got to keep looking at what the new options are ahead of you. Some of which it's obvious how you're going to monetize them. Some of it's less obvious, but you've got to try them all and see what sticks. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Once you've got your head around one social media platform, I mean, how long did it take to figure out how much, you know, that you can make money from Facebook? Then there's a new one along. You've got to do the whole thing all over again with TikTok. Uh, Janelle, uh, you work uh, with so many brands. As you said you built on that during the pandemic. A lot of your brands are actually now uh, online. They, they operate purely on that, you know, the social world. How do you uh, navigate pitching those social brands versus the more traditional ones? When I think what I would say is like social is the new currency, because I think it's very easy to see if a brand has followers. It's easy to see if how many followers they have, the kind of engagement they're getting. Whereas before, you know, you could say we've got the, the you know, the new big thing. Well, you couldn't prove it was or wasn't, but now you can easily prove, yes, there's traction behind this. Yes, there's not traction behind that. So I think in terms of um, when you're advising people where to pitch or where to think about, it's about those places that are aligned with the products or the thing that they're trying to do, because news now is so 
so many different kinds of news and different kinds of news platforms with a different focus, with a different um, thing they're looking at. You've got like from Vice to BuzzFeed to the Mirror to the HuffPost as was. Um, all of these people have a different focus, whether that's culture, lifestyle, news, um, you know, lad Bible, all of those things. I think it's about saying, okay, well, this is what you're trying to do. This is the audience you're trying to attract. And I think using your social channels and the kind of people who engage with you, their synergy here, and also the ability to show that that other brand that you're trying to pitch to, that's also worth putting you on because it's like a mutual exchange of kind of credit brand credibility, so to speak. Uh, let's let's get to something many of our of many people joining us today from the world of PR are really really interested in, and that is cutting through that noise you know how is it you can reach out successfully uh, to those working in editorial teams and, and a decision a state of the media report found that 63 percent of journalists that they spoke to said the best way to make their jobs easier is to understand uh you know their target audience you know what they find relevant and what are the some what are the and best ways of getting through and cutting through to editorial staff you know how they can how you can actually people from working in PR can actually help uh, those working in the newsrooms uh, uh, Luke uh, what would be your advice to all those out there working in PR what's the best way to cut through to you to get out of your inbox and actually make it onto onto the many publications that you you oversee such a good question. Um, the, uh, forgive me if, if this sounds a bit obvious, but always a face uh, and a story as well. Um, that human connection, particularly when it comes to us and our audiences, um, just, just trumps all of it. So I know um, this is happening in, in, in many cases already, um, but no matter the kind of the hook for the, for, the, for the pitch or for the story, as long as we've got somebody to kind of to exemplify it or you know, to, to, have to be that example, uh, then it's more likely to be picked up um, by our news desk um, as well. And in terms of the, the, the types of content as well, uh, when it comes to our digital audiences, which are which essentially that, that is our audience, um, there's a huge um, opportunity there for what we call what's on content as well. You know, when it comes to people want to know what to do, um, particularly locally, and also just in many of our areas as well, we have people who travel down, say, from London or from, from around the country. And if we can give them stories around that, for instance, you know, where to go, uh, who runs those places, who runs those restaurant shops, for instance, as well. Uh, that's the type of content that really resonates and, and really drives a significant audience for us. Lily, what, what about you as somebody, it's your job to pitch stories, you know, how are you able to do that successfully that, you know, you think people working from PR, they, they could benefit from on that kind of advice yeah definitely I think the thing is from a freelance perspective is that really what we're looking for is exclusives so if you're sending us a press release it's not really any use to us because you will have sent that out to absolutely everybody else um, and although it might be useful for a bit of background information the odd statistic we're not going to be able to pitch um, an exclusive story out of a press release um, my advice usually to PRs is actually that I prefer relationships that kind of work the other way around. So if I am looking for particular experts or particular case studies, I will put calls out on social media or through particular platforms. Um, and I want then PRs to come to me to match up what I'm looking for. I don't tend to work the other way around. So if PRs pitch to me or send me press releases, 99% of the time, it will just get deleted. Um, but what I am looking for is really good PRs who can say, yes, I've got exactly the right expert or exactly the right case study. They've not spoken to anyone else on this subject um, and I can give them to you exclusively. Um, and with that um, as well, you need to be able to come up with a good. So if you say you've got someone, then actually have them because I have had a lot of situations where I've been promised someone and then it doesn't come to fruition, um, which means I'm unlikely to kind of want to work with that PR again. So it's, it's being reliable or being upfront um, about stuff as well. Um, and I think it's also understanding that as freelancers, we're very much the middleman and we don't have as much control or as much information as a staffer. So we may just be in the pitching stage 
and um, we don't know if a story is going to get picked up or not. Once it is commissioned, we usually don't know when it's going to be published. It's very much your guess is as good as mine. Um, editors are so busy that we don't want to bother them with questions like when, you know, when something going to be published. Um, and we don't know if links are going to be kept in or not. And we, we're not going to go chasing that either. Um, we're very much kind of, like I say, stuck between the, the PR and the, and the commissioning editors. So we are rest restricted sometimes in the amount of information we can, we can give back to you. So it's just having an understanding um, of that as well um, is really helpful. It's um it's so interesting just looking at how uh, social media can be used, you know some you know press releases are important, but I am finding it's not quite up there as this you know only way that, that they used to be to get to journalists right with with a uh, with a press release. And if you look at something like the child accused story as uh, the black uh, girl school girl who was strip searched at a school while she was on her period. And that story started, I wanna say it was actually one of the, it was a regional story in Hackney. And someone just tweeted the findings of the, of the report, looking into whether, you know, how could, this could have even happened, did racism play a part? And that tweet just went viral, if you like. It went mental and it led to all the major uh, broadcasters picking up. That's a big example, but I have had other uh, press press officers on online on social media just tweet a story tweet a story you know just put it out there and actually you know once people start retweeting it there's a couple of stories I actually picked up uh, with somebody working in PR and I just got in touch and said gosh this is something we'd want to do uh, on, on five news uh, Alison from, from your point of view you know are press releases you know a big deal is that one of the still a significant way you're getting your news connecting with people and if so What's your advice? You know, how, does, how can somebody make make sure that one stands out? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a, a significant number of stories do still come via um, PRs. I think the thing that I would say that's sort of central to everything we do, and I, I think it's probably true of a lot of news organisations, it's about um, humanising it and telling the real people's stories. I'm just so not interested in polls and surveys and quotes from anonymous boards. And um, what I am interested in is real people's stories who can um, explain explain how this particular thing is impacting on their life. Um, and they need to be real people with um, who are willing to be identified, who you know we can get pictures of or footage or video of um, that brings it to life. Um, and that those stories are told cleanly in any kind of release and clearly. Um, and it's it's kind of that simple. Really. It's about humanizing everything. Yeah. Okay, well, um, here's another survey for you. <laughs> <laughs> State of the Media report uh, found that 76 of the journalists uh, that they spoke to named a press release as the one thing they'd most like to uh, receive uh, from PRs. Uh, Janelle, when it comes to, you know, I, I'm sure so many people come to you because they love the fact that you were, a, you, you still are a journalist, you're always a journalist, that you are a journalist and you get it. You get exactly what journalists are looking for. So, so what's your advice uh, to people working in PR, you know, about how to, how to build, how to, to get a really good press release that, that can cut through? So normally when you look at press releases, there are two things that they're either really functional and a bit boring, like Alice said, there's no human element to it, or they're almost clickbait themselves. They're always trying to create that clickbaity oh. headline. Oh, and so I've been there. Those, yes. those two things, because as soon as a journalist starts reading the first few paragraphs, they'll know whether that story is not what the headline says. So I think you want to make it interesting, but it needs to be honest about what it is. I think sometimes as well, people think I'm going to tell them this amazing narrative. And I always suggest to people the most interesting facts that are the most pertinent to that publication, that platform, need to go towards the top, preferably in bullet point forms so that people can see the most interesting things that you're talking about. And then the other thing that I often say is um, sometimes, you know, we know like the BBC has got the 50-50 project, people are looking for diversity in terms of commentary these days. So don't just have three men, offer up a couple of people. It's like um, Lily just said, sometimes they say they've got someone and they haven't got them. Offer them a man, offer them a woman, 
offer them some ethnic diversity, offer them someone with a disability, try and give a couple of options of people that could offer a quote or add some colour to the story, as well as the case studies. And having a case study, I think is really important. If there's things that you have like great B-roll, you know you've got great film, you know you've got great quality photos, all of these things, when you offer them up, makes the journalist's job easier because you have all of the assets that they need to help create the story. Um, and just think of the platform. If it's telly, some people say, oh, come down to our this. Well, there's no picture. What could we film there? So in your own mind, it's about thinking, what is the best platform to tell this story on? Is it telly? Is it radio? Is it a paper? Is it digital? It's unlikely to be all of them. <laughs> so it's about really narrowing it down to who you're trying to target with this story, what's the best platform and pitching it in that sense um, because I think you'll have more success. But some people just try to send it to everyone with not a lot of elements and then they wonder why no one ever gets back to them It's because you haven't got enough content there. That's what people need is content. Do you think it's worth, uh, Janelle, even putting it in the, uh, in the subject line that you, know, you do have somebody, you know, a woman or somebody who, who, who is brown or somebody living with disability is, do, you think, do you think that might be worth it? I don't know, because ultimately it's going to be the story that people want. If the story yeah. is good enough, then they're going to look down and see, OK, well, what are the other elements? Because I know that when, you know, when I was working in a newsroom, it comes through, oh, this is the story. OK, well, who have you got? OK, we've got this. OK, what else is there? OK, there's that. So I think story comes first. It doesn't matter. You could have the most diverse <laughs> quotes, but the story is not very good. It still won't get published. So no. I think, yeah, story. Very not, no, because you, you, you raised such a brilliant point I cannot I don't know what it's like with uh, publications but in in tv there is there's even uh there's like a diversity uh we have to have a certain number of people from a particular background and we've actually had uh, debriefs at the end of a show where we could you know we'll, we'll get a you know a bit of a bollocking from our editor saying what Janelle just said, we cannot just have uh, white men, where are the other voices? Because we can sometimes get in trouble for that. So that's such a, a really, really good point for PRs out there to make sure sometimes what you are putting forward is, is diverse. Uh, Luke, and when it does come to uh, PRs getting in contact uh, with you, what's your biggest bug there? I have to say, I know we've spoken about kind of Twitter, using Twitter as a platform for this, but I'll say tw uh, sort of cold call Twitter DMs. Um, yeah, I'd much prefer it if, if that came in response to, yeah, a journal request shout out or, you know, maybe even a follow up to an email you might have sent us where perhaps you haven't had a response. Um, but just, just to kind of go straight in there with the DMs um, around something that, you, that I might not be that familiar with um, is, a bit, is a bit of a turn off. Um, and also just to kind of pick up on what, what the guys were saying earlier about um, emails that kind of come to our inbox that we can tell have just gone to like, you know, 200 different publications and, you know, even if they are kind of localized, I think just the, the messaging in that is, is very obvious if, if, if it's a very generic email that hasn't really been tailored to our audience. And there isn't that um, understanding or appreciation of, of our the differences between obviously publications and, and audiences and everything. Uh, what about you, Lily? Uh, what is, uh, would you say, the key things we are need to understand when, when getting in contact with and reaching out to those who are, who are freelancers? I think it's having a real understanding of what that individual freelancer does um, and actually um, rather than just sort of using a, you know, generic database, sometimes it's, it's good to personalise it and have an understanding. So for myself, I do quite a lot of different things, but I get an awful lot of press releases that are not relevant. Um, so if you can do some background research on freelancers that you're you're getting in contact with um, and have a real understanding um, in terms of don't don't phone us i know that seems quite blunt but i get so many phone calls saying did you get that press release um, and I, I now basically don't answer my phone because um, it's just a waste of time if you've already sent it to me if, I, if I'm interested, I respond. If I'm not, I'll delete. But phoning me up is just going to annoy me um, and waste my time. So, and again, think about freelancers. A lot of freelancers are women. A lot of them have families. You know, ringing them up at half past five when in the middle of doing tea is just like the worst time. So, yeah, do your homework really is, is what I would say when it comes to freelancers. Oh, yeah, little little things, little uh, little tips like that would go a long way. Um, Alison, what about you? What are your biggest bugbears when it comes to uh, PRs getting in touch with you? 
Um, I think probably a lot of the similar, it's a, the generic press releases, which don't really have any kind of, um, they're not tailored at all to... I hate that so much. I'm like, do you even watch the show? Do you watch it? Do you obviously don't? Why, why are you sending me... Yeah, so I think it's those kind of, you hit an, an automatic delete without even opening them, unfortunately. And I appreciate it's really difficult, though, because if, you know, it's very hard to, to you know, when you've got an awful lot of people that you need to get in touch with. But if there's even just a little bit of um, personality at the top, which kind of makes for a, a, um, a sort of an emotional connection with the person that you're writing to. Um, and I think, it's, as everyone has said, it's understanding the, um, the title that you're trying to pitch to. Um, and why it's going to be in their interests. I mean, people are only interested in things that are in their interests. So, you know, it, it really is, you're, you're, I suppose it's that point of like, you're not selling the product for yourself. You are trying to sell an idea and therefore you've got to find, okay, what is it people are like about that idea? It's not about you. It's about the person you're trying to sell to. Uh, the, the main thing is though, that journalists and those working in PR, they actually need each other, right? We journalists need a good story as much as those working in PR are trying to, to sell it. Uh, Janelle, how important is, is building that relationship, is just getting that relationship, forging it, and then building on it? I think it's really important. And I think sometimes it can just be nice touches, like making sure you keep in touch with people, maybe just like once a year, just checking that you're still there, just saying hello, don't need a response. Um, you know, not expecting anything, but just kind of checking up on people. And I think the other thing is in terms of building a relationship, I was, remember when I was running a TV channel and people would come and say, we want to do this show before asking, is there anything that you're looking for? Like what kind of shows are you trying to do this year? So them not understanding what I was doing in the direction I was going in. So I think by understanding, like you say, have you watched five news before you send them a press release? If you haven't, then it's not going to help the relationship. So all of these things help by being interested, understanding the platform, and also understanding what this station or paper or digital outlet is actually trying to achieve. And then figuring out is what I'm doing in line with that Will it be helpful for us to be in this relationship together? And if no, don't even waste your own time in that sense. Um, go where it's going to be fruitful for you too, as well as the um, journalists. Okay, um, let me just, let's go to some of the questions that we've been getting uh, from people uh, watching today. Loads of questions I have to say. This is for Luke uh, to kick things off. Uh, do you think there's still an appetite to share good news in regional media? I work for a charity, they say, and we have loads of upbeat, heartwarming, real life stories to share, but struggle in some regions to get the coverage. Any advice they're asking, Luke? Yeah, there absolutely is. Um, it, de it very much depends on the story and the strength of that story. Uh, so for sure, when it, comes to, when it comes to charity stories, I think the kind of traditional way, or at least the way we used to cover it would be with a big sort of giant picture of a check. Um, it just simply doesn't work anymore, but actually if, you know, what's the story behind that fundraising effort? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's it's a, probably a little bit of a misconception. It's all bad news that um, that, that, that has traction and, and and travels well. It's it's all, it's all manner of content that will still generate an audience because of the interest to to our to our readers. Some of our most read stories are profiles on the on the best pubs, for instance, and yeah. you know, we may go and review that. So and that's very much you know I put that in this sort of positive category. So um, absolutely, there is that appetite for that, and there and, there, and, there, and that interest in that kind of wide variety of content, and that makes people smile and um, and, and gives them you know, positive things to do. Really, actually, this person was asking about regional news, even national news stories. You know, you've got the and finally always looking uh, for a good good uh, good news story. For, uh, five News has its high five. So yeah, you know, go bigger, um, aim for the regions and also national news. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to put this to Alison, actually. Uh, this person is asking, with journalists working more at home, do the majority still work a nine to five anymore? If not, is there an expectation that PRs need to respond to inquiries outside of the, the normal nine to five? Yeah, I'm not sure that the normal nine to five has really applied to journalists for as long as I can remember, if I'm honest. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess I guess um, every, everyone who wants to have their own time where their machines are switched off. And however, I do think in journalism, if you get a query, um, I mean, I guess it depends with what immediate urgency that the person writes back with a query, but I would always aim to answer it as swiftly as possible. I think I think the nine to five is sort of long. Uh, Janelle, this is for you. Uh, this person's saying, love to pick you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Alison, my, my uh, Zoom froze, continue. 
No, that's me done. That's good. Okay, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, the joys of Zoom. Uh, Janelle, this one's for you. Uh, this person says, I'd love to pick Janelle's brains about doing comms for NGOs something you have for experience in Janelle. Uh, if your aim is to influence decision makers, so we're talking civil servants, parliamentarians, nationally, nationally and internationally, are you best off sticking to the outlets those people are likely to consume? So i.e., like, you know, the BBC, Guardian. Uh, but yeah, that, that one's for you, Janelle. Um, and like you say, probably both. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. And I think sometimes as well, we can get into this thing that we think we know what kind of newspapers certain people read and what kind of media places people will go with influence. And I don't think that always cuts through and you might not always be able to get to people on those platforms either. Um, if it's quite niche, I think a good thing I would suggest is about building your online brand as a charity um, and kind of using some of those connections looking out for when people are talking about it. I think the other thing about a lot of issues, especially to do with charities, quite cyclical. So at the moment, if you've got a charity that works in immigration, you're going to be right up there on everyone's list for people to come and talk to at the moment. Other charities probably not going to get so much limelight because the news agenda only has so much on. So I think it's about building those, especially social channels outside of the mainstream kind of media and being able to highlight those issues as and when they kind of come up and see when things are trending towards that. Um, I don't think there's a simple, easy answer to do it though, um, but I don't think we can assume that all the decision makers watch the BBC News, for instance, because I, I don't think that always tracks to be true. Mm, uh, this is uh, another question for Luke. Uh, what's the appetite for editorial media partnerships or campaigns, uh, for example? Uh, what would you say is the best way uh, to pitch these? Yes, I guess a really, really good question. And again, it's, it very much depends on it. I think we would have to have a look at our sort of audience data as to what what our loyal readers are, are coming back to. Uh, and if there is something that um, we know is going to have a kind of positive outcome or at least, you know, an outcome, uh, we would kind of align ourselves with that. So, uh, and, and, you know, I don't think it's anything that people aren't aware of when it comes to resource. Um, we're always... Um, always looking for you know for extra um, support when it comes to that as well. So um, as I say, very much depend on on what that was. Uh, but yeah, that, that's very much an opportunity that we would be, we'd be interested in. Uh, Lily, I wonder if you could answer uh, this question. Uh, this person's asking, what advice would you give if the press release is less people focused and more industry centric? I think that's really good question uh, but yes if um, it can be a little bit more difficult to cut through if it is yeah if it is less focused on on an actual personal people yeah and I think this is this comes back to what we've been talking about is um, there's not really much point in sending out a blanket press release to every single journalist you can think of it's about thinking about right what journalists are are, are writing or producing content in this space that would be interested in it there will be people that perhaps um in more specialist publications maybe trade publications or specialist websites um or even youtube channels that are covering content that is more you know business to business industry centric data led um and it's not just um, you know, all on human focus. So it, it's about, when we keep saying this really, it's about understanding the different media outlets and tailoring uh, your content to them. So you're not necessarily going to always, you know, get your content into the mirror, but there may be actually a really niche publication that is exactly your target audience that you need to get in front of. Um, so I think it is about you know, just thinking about who is the target audience um, and, and being much more nuanced in your approach rather than a kind of blanket, let's send this out to everyone. Mm. Uh, Janelle, I wonder if uh, you could answer this question. As, as somebody uh, talking about working in a charity, uh, for a charity, uh, what's the biggest advice for somebody working for a charity to get heard in the noise when they have limited capacity when it comes to staff and time? I think focus on the things that are most important and focus on the things that are specialist to you, that are niche to you, that you are doing and not many other people are doing. I think that's the way to kind of get some cut through and is to be authentic in that. And I think as someone, you know, as Lily was just saying earlier, I think a lot of times people think they want to go for numbers 
And it's not always about scale. Sometimes it's about specifically who is important to you. So yes, you could try and go to everybody, but is that an important metric? And I think it is about what is the metric that you're using? What is it? Is it that you want a particular person to see it? In which case, you know, you need to go about that a certain way. But if you do want numbers, you also need to go about that a different way in terms of getting like mass wide, you can't make yourself go viral, but you can, you know, there are things you can do that can enhance your content, that it can be seen by more people. So I think with limited capacity, it's important to focus on smaller metrics, probably smaller audiences and making it extremely targeted and niche in your sweet spot. Okay, guys, just to say, uh, we do have a few minutes left. So if you do have any questions, send them uh, my way. I am putting them to, as you can see, putting them, putting them to the, the panellists. So yeah, just a few minutes left. If you want to have a question, get them in now. Um, I'm going to put this uh, next question to Luke. Uh, this person saying, know your inboxes are always super full. So is it helpful to follow up on a press release if no reply, or is this an irritant? I personally think that's fine. Um, I know that body's returning to that earlier point about it being a kind of generic email. If that follow up is then in the same vein, if it's a very, uh, you know, something I think one I got the other day was sort of dear sir, which was a bit of a giveaway. If it's you know in that and that's with that same theme, uh, I would shy away from that. But absolutely, if you if you haven't had that response and you haven't, you know, you tried other ways of communicating, um, you know, a polite kind of follow up a week later. Um, maybe asking why there was a delay um, is, I think, is absolutely fine. Obviously, no guarantee there's going to be a response, but you know, I can completely see from the other perspective. Um, if you sent something politely and you haven't had a response, you know, how else are you going to get that response, right? Listen, uh, this is a question for me actually. Uh, as an editor in chief, but also to help uh, you guys watching as well, as an editor in chief, do you still do you do you read press releases? Do you still pick up stories from them? Um. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, oh, probably not. Occasionally, I can't say it's a lot, but I can. Okay. So occasionally, okay. and interestingly, that's if something drops in my inbox and it's got a really good headline, and I think, oh, that sounds interesting, I would just, out of curiosity, open it, and then occasionally, yes. But I, I can't say that happens a lot. But if it, if you've got the right headline, yes. So I imagine then that a follow up email on a press release you haven't responded to. Would that be an irritant for you? Um, yeah, I would just, yeah, I'm sorry. It sounds, I'm sorry to say it, but yeah. No, I don't say sorry. We need to understand how the editors think, you know, what you're looking for. It's perfect, yeah. exactly what we need. Uh, question for Janelle here. Uh, what's the absolute key for getting your foot in the door uh, with a journalist, and more specifically with relation uh, to subject lines? Okay, so Alison was saying subject lines key for her. Uh, yeah, Janelle, what's, what's the best way this person's asking, getting, getting, getting seen? Oh, really um, probably one of my secret tips is, you know, follow people on Twitter. What are they talking about? What are they interested in? And then you kind of will get a sense of what they talk about, what they are looking for, and use that as a guide, like for your subject header, not untruthfully, as I said before earlier, but you can use that as a guide. And also in that same way, you know, you'll get a sense of whether people keep saying my DMs are open for stories. Sometimes people put that in their bios, you know, open for DMs. Sometimes people don't. I mean, I know it's irritating, but I see it from the other side, which is people just trying to hear something and no one likes being ghosted. So it's it's hard on all sides, but I think understanding on both sides that sometimes people are not gonna get back. Sometimes people are busy. Sometimes people are persistent because they care as annoying as that is. Um, but I think if it, to build relationships, I think we have to on both sides kind of see the pressure points and the pluses and sometimes some people have pushed on something and actually it's been a really good idea that you hadn't really seen already and then when you see it again you're like oh actually that's fairly interesting so I think you know it's just a bit of grace on both sides to keep building those relationships I think but understanding the person I think is key. Uh, Luke I'm going to put this to you uh, what's the best way uh, for someone to get feedback on a press release just you know find out what was good what was wrong yeah, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll double check to see whether it's been published as well. Um, and then that, that's probably the easiest way of seeing some positive feedback because you could you could see the kind of you know the outcome of, of you sending that that pitch in. Um, perhaps if it if it hasn't been published again, you know that that very kind of politely worded uh, sort of follow up uh, email or contact to the news desk again, you know, from my own sort of personal perspective, uh, would be perfectly fine just to kind of you know, and and then that helps as well to kind of build up that contact as well because because we. Would have then spoken more than once on that particular matter. So, yeah, just that 
as I say, that, that follow up um, works well for us. Okay, I think we can squeeze in just one more question. I'll put this to you, Lily. Uh, would giving access to media, because I think as a freelancer, this could be quite uh, handy for you. Uh, would giving access to media such as video, photos, logos, etc., uh, does that make it more likely that uh, a journalist would engage with a release, would you say? Yeah, I think it depends what it is, but it, certainly if it's something that has got a person central to the story, perhaps it's a case study and you've got a, a good image, that can certainly help a freelancer with a pitch um, to show that that person's, you know, already been photographed, they're willing to be identified. Um, so that can help. And I think definitely if it's like a something that's really central um cent centralizes on a individual story a real life story or a case study then images of people can be helpful i'm not sure that logos would be much use um but also they need to be decent photos and that that's tricky because i know myself having to source photos for for a lot of stories now that it's it can be quite difficult to get just a good you know profile picture of someone so make sure if you are attaching it that um, so my my advice would be actually perhaps attach it as a low resolution picture, but say that you've yes. got higher resolution available, so you're not spamming up somebody's inbox, but they can see the image um, and then they know that there's a higher resolution one um, that they can get hold of. Okay, I'm gonna have to bring this to an end. Just, you know, hopefully Zoom won't shut us down after the hour, right? No, we don't have that kind of Zoom. Uh, I wanna say thank you so much uh, to our panelists, Alice Phillips, Janelle Aldred, Lily Cantor, and Luke Jacobs. Also, wanna thank you, all you guys that just tuned in uh, to watch uh, all of this. Just thank you so much. I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. Hope you found it a nice thing and it could help you in any way, uh, shape or form. If there's anything you missed or actually you really enjoyed it, you wanna go back to some of the things we've been talking about, you can, or even share it with your colleagues, you can uh, actually go onto the Cision uh, website, cision.co.uk uh, slash resources. Uh, it's gonna be available there on demand. You'll also be able to download the Cision annual state to the media report spoke about it a little bit earlier and that's a survey of more than 3,800 reporters that decision spoke to uh, giving PR pros uh, the insight they need to hopefully win over journalists but again thank you all so so much enjoy the rest of your day I'm going to go and do five news bye guys <laughs> bye